Canada is in the middle of a crime boom. And crime in Canada. Canada. Are Canada is on the rise again. That's right. Puss Canada is actually home to some of the grimiest, most sophisticated criminals in the world. It's gone largely unnoticed in the United States, probably because nobody in the U.S. talks or cares much about what goes on up in Canada, or as I call it, Diet Minnesota. But believe it or not, Canada is not only home to powerful 1% biker gangs and Italian mafia syndicates, in recent years it has become a lucrative target for international drug smuggling organizations. But before we talk about who those players are, let's look at the reasons for why Canada is such an attractive target for high-level criminals. And just a reminder to subscribe to the channel and leave us a like and a comment if you enjoy this video. Okay, so why has Canada suddenly become such a hotbed of international criminal activity? The first and probably most important reason is that Canada lacks effective organized crime laws like the RICO statutes that we have in the United States. The Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, better known as RICO, are anti-mafia laws passed by Congress in the 1970s and then famously exploited by Rudy Giuliani in the early 90s to permanently cripple the five families of New York City. The most broad explanation for the RICO laws are essentially this. They allow for an individual to be prosecuted for committing crimes as part of a larger criminal organization. Furthermore, it allows for prosecution of people who direct and order others to commit crime, like a mob boss ordering a murder, which is precisely why the RICO laws were originally dubbed the Mafia Laws. They were meant to allow a way for the government to take down powerful mafia godfathers who would never be caught committing crimes red-handed. The laws have since expanded in scope and now mostly target high-level drug trafficking organizations. The feds can sit on an organization or a cartel for years, building a large web of individual criminals and then charging them under one umbrella, and then of course imposing huge federal sentences. Now almost all states have their version of RICO. In California where I live, these laws are used to dismantle street gangs. So if I commit a robbery and the prosecutor execution could prove that I'm a member or even just affiliated with the Mexican Mafia, let's say, I can now be prosecuted and sentenced for the crime of robbery and given an additional sentence, aka a gang enhancement, for being part of that said gang. Canada doesn't really have these laws. There were finally some anti-organized crime laws passed in 2006, but according to many in Canadian law enforcement, they don't work. For example, in Canada, there is no mafia association law, which makes it a crime to simply be part of an identified criminal organization. This makes it a haven for mafia members seeking refuge from prosecution in places like Italy. It also has notoriously lax money laundering laws, which for obvious reasons make it an attractive target for all sorts of criminal groups who want to clean up their dirty money. Furthermore, Canadian federal law enforcement is still bogged down by European-style, antiquated, and over bureaucracy government. Basically, they're socialists. And socialist governments tend to be slower and more inefficient than systems like the United States or, God forbid if you're a criminal, Dubai or Saudi Arabia. It's getting so dire up in Canada that the Attorney General for the province of British Columbia said, the legal situation cannot be allowed to continue if public confidence in our justice system is to be preserved. This is serious stuff. Another reason that Canada is such a good place to be if you're a criminal are because of the lenient sentences. If you get caught, you're probably not going to jail for very long. Unlike the United States, who you could argue over-prosecute and over-sentence criminals, Canada does the exact opposite. In fact, 73% of Canadians recently polled said that the justice system is too lenient, especially on violent criminals. In fact, the Canadian Supreme Court recently banned life in prison without parole, calling it cruel and inhumane. There are technically mandatory minimum sentences for drug trafficking and high-level organized crime, but they're not nearly as harsh as in the US, and many judges refuse to impose them at all. Canada, again, has a softer, more progressive, more European attitude towards crime, especially nonviolent crime like drugs, which is not a bad thing in principle. I'm not some old boy, southern, tough on crime, zealot asshole either. I'm very much anti-state overreach and anti-tyranny. I believe in scaling down the size of government in general. But the fact is, the more you reduce penalties for criminal behavior, the more criminal behavior will occur. I'm telling you, when I was in prison, I knew career criminals who would literally study law books to see how much time they would get for certain crimes. Oh wow, I'll get way too much time for identity theft in the state of Oregon. I'll stick with Grand Theft Auto. It was that kind of thing. That's really how criminals, and especially criminal organizations, think. They're not illogical. They think in terms of cost-benefit analysis, just like me and you. 
How much money will I make doing this crime versus how much time will I get if I get caught? If you want an example, the American Mafia, and we know this because we've had very well-connected ex-Mafia guys on my podcast, and they've told me this. The Detroit mob, the mafia who still operate in Detroit, Michigan, have outlawed debt collection through violence. So say in the old days, if a mafia guy had a Shylocking business and he loaned money to a guy and the guy didn't pay him back, or a bookmaker took a bet with a degenerate gambler and the guy lost and he didn't pay, they would beat you up and break your legs or even murder you if the debt was bad enough. No more. In Detroit, but probably a lot of other cities that still have mafia activity, the bosses have given the word that you cannot use violence to collect. The sentences are just too outrageous. 10 or 15 years for slapping around a guy who owes you money. It's not worth it. You have to just take the loss. But in Canada, the wolves are running wild and they are thriving. Let's take a look at some of the biggest criminal actors in Canada right now. Number one is the Sicilian Mafia. The oldest and most established crime families are based in Montreal and Toronto. The most prominent of these families is the Rizzuto family, who operate much like the mob in the US and were once known as a wing of the Bonanno family in New York. They're into the same legacy rackets as the American mob, gambling, loan sharking, construction, extortion, but they're also big time drug traffickers and gun runners. Back when Canadian grown pot used to dominate the Northeastern US market, Market, it was the Sicilian families of Canada who allied with French Canadian smugglers and outlaw biker gangs to move tons of it a year across the border. Nowadays, the drugs are coming the opposite direction. Sicilians are now importing record levels of cocaine, meth, and untaxed cigarettes into Canada. And now they have competition from other Italians. The Andrangheta from Calabria, Italy, the richest and most powerful of all the Italian organizations, now has a heavy presence in Canada. These are expert cocaine traffickers, and they're deeply allied with Mexican cartels, especially Sinaloa. There's been an actual blood feud going on in Montreal, and not just back in the day, Today, in this day and age, broad daylight assassinations, the daughter-in-law of a mafia figure was actually gunned down outside of the spa business she owns. The grandson of Godfather Nicola Rosuto was even shot to death with a sniper rifle. This is wild. They're running around in Montreal in 2024 the way the five families moved in the 1970s, back when murder was out of control in New York. Next up on the list of Canada's baddest gangsters are the Chinese. Now, the Chinese triads are based in Western Canada, primarily in and around Vancouver, BC. And as you can probably guess, they're quiet and extremely sophisticated. The triads are a collection of Chinese criminal clans that date back to the opium wars of the 19th century. They have a huge presence in Vancouver, BC, where they're able to blend in with the millions of other Chinese nationals who call Vancouver home. We all know that the Chinese are providing the precursor chemicals to Mexican cartels to produce fentanyl, but now they've gone a step further. Not only are Chinese criminal groups smuggling in ready-made fentanyl through the port of Vancouver, they are now funding and producing fentanyl super labs domestically inside of Canada. If this thing reaches scale, it could completely disrupt the market and cut out the Mexican cartels who've been attempting to penetrate the Canadian market with their meth and fentanyl for a decade now. The RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is basically Canada's version of the FBI, say that the Chinese triad are now exporting the fentanyl they produce in Canada. Wow. Globalization has made the world of drug trafficking very complicated indeed. The triads are also extremely sophisticated money launderers. Here's how it works in Vancouver. First, front companies purchase precursor chemicals from Chinese chemical companies and smuggle them en masse into Canada through the port of Vancouver. The chemicals are then sold to drug traffickers who produce the meth and fentanyl in Canadian labs and then distribute them onto the streets of Vancouver. The drug proceeds are then dropped off to Chinese gamblers, who use them to purchase poker chips at high-end casinos, and then they cash out those chips for washed money. They then deposit this newly laundered money into clandestine banks, who then wire the funds back to China. And then finally, these Chinese traffickers use those funds to purchase luxury real estate back in Vancouver. We're talking billions of dollars a year they launder in Vancouver this way. They've dumped so much money into Vancouver real estate over the last two decades that they've artificially driven up prices for everyone, enough to where the Attorney General of British Columbia has declared an emergency. Besides the Chinese triad and the Italian mafia, Canada has a plethora of homegrown street gangs, many of whom smuggle and distribute the drugs imported by the Chinese and Italian kingpins. The Hells Angels, once the most 
most feared and powerful of the 1% biker gangs have their home base in Vancouver. They do much of the legwork involved in the smuggling of cocaine and meth from the US through the Canadian land border, as well as those distant Vancouver islands where they use fast boats and fishing vessels to try and outwit and outrun the border patrol. They're also big into MDMA and ecstasy production. They smuggle in the precursors from abroad and then manufacture and distribute the drugs wholesale in Vancouver and across the rest of Canada. They're very entrenched in the fabric of Canadian street culture and are therefore perfect retail distributors of wholesale drugs imported from larger global criminal syndicates, like the Mexicans, like the Italians, like the Chinese. And let's not forget about the native gangs. Native in Canadian refers to a Native American, or in their case, a Native Canadian. Located on reservations mostly in the middle of the country in provinces like Saskatchewan and Manitoba, these tribal gangs have linked with Mexican cartels who are exploiting the vast and underpoliced areas of Montana and the Dakotas to smuggle up coke, fentanyl, and meth into Canada by way of these lawless reservations. There's a crime bonanza going on in Canada right now, and everyone wants a piece of the action. The demand for drugs is steady, and prices are much higher than in the US, and therefore, more profitable. And their weak organized crime and money laundering laws, and relatively lenient criminal sentences, have made it a safe haven for criminal syndicates looking to expand their international markets. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe, like, and leave us a comment. We're dropping videos all the time. Thank you for your support. We will see you next time.